And we are still talking to Ms. Rita Nansasi, who is the Director, Legal Services at the Uganda Retirement Benefits uh, Regulatory uh, Authority. We are talking about pension schemes. We are talking about saving for retirement because, as a matter of fact, as we say on the program, the best way actually to uh, secure your future is by saving, by putting that money aside, but also investing that money so that it can give you returns. So you can enjoy and sit back at the end of uh, your, you know, your working life when your energy and strength is gone. You know you have something to lie on and for something for your probably grandsons and daughters. And now, Miss Rita, before we went into a break, we had a very interesting conversation here on the pension schemes and the categories of these pension schemes. Uh, first, take us through first of all the categories of these pension schemes. Okay, thank you, Anthony. We have we, we've clustered the schemes into three categories. Mm. First, we have the mandatory schemes. Okay. These, these are schemes where members are mandated by law to contribute into those schemes. And these include the National Social Security Fund, which is for those working in the private sector and recently extended to those in the informal, informal employment. Then we have a parliamentary pension scheme. This is also a mandatory, a mandatory scheme created by an act of parliament for the members of parliament and the employees of the Parliamentary Service Commission. Then we also have the Makere University Retirement Benefit Scheme. This was recent, last year in June, uh, granted an exemption to opt out of NSSF to have their standalone scheme for strictly the employees of the Makere University. So those are the three schemes in the mandatory category. Then we have the occupational-based schemes. These are schemes that are set up by the different employers for their employees. This means in addition to what they are contributing to the NSSF, there's an additional saving they make to these occupational schemes. And we have about 60 occupational schemes that are licensed for the different employers. Then in addition to those, we have umbrella schemes. These umbrella schemes are schemes that are set up mainly by insurance companies to cater for those employers that are not in position to set up segregated schemes for their different employees, but they plug into the umbrella schemes. Mm. So they register in these schemes and their employees benefit. Mm. Remember, this is in addition to what they're already contributing to NSSF. Mm. So an employer that has such an arrangement is a better employer. You're an employer of choice. Because if I know you're going to contribute for me in NSSF and then go ahead and contribute in the occupational scheme or an umbrella scheme that you have chosen to belong to, then at, point, at the point of retirement, I'm in a better position because I have made additional savings. Mm. So those are the three categories. We also have schemes that have been licensed to target the informal sector. Mm. These include Mazima and Kasita. So all those that are employed or self-employed can still register with these schemes and contribute for their retirement. Mm. Let's talk a little more on the umbrella scheme. Yes. Now, you said these are regulated, not regulated. These are set up, set up insurance by companies. insurance companies. Uh, can these be approached by individuals who are Probably they don't have NSSF uh, schemes. They don't have their occupational schemes. I'm just an individual. I don't know how I earn my money, but I want to save for retirement. Or there are also for organizations and institutions. No, for umbrella schemes, anybody Any. can save with an umbrella scheme. At any age? At any age. Okay. You just walk in there, get mm. registered, and start remitting your contributions. Mm. Particular employer or a particular class of people. It mm. is anyone that is willing to save for their retirement that can walk into an umbrella scheme and register and start opening an account and start contributing for their retirement. How do they work? Do they also have a, an interest rate? I mean, sorry, uh, do they have a rate at which they operate according to income or you're free to start with anything? Most umbrella schemes, you are free to contribute whatever amount of money you want mm. because it's out of your own volition, out of your will. So you can say, I want to contribute 10,000 per month or 100,000 per month. You go and register and set your target and then you work towards that. Mm. And the beauty with all these schemes licensed by all brothers, they have a legal structure mm. within which they are set. They are required to have a board of trustees. The trustees are the decision makers in these schemes. They make the decisions. Then they, have, they are required to have a custodian. This is a financial institution where this money is kept. Mm. So when this money is remitted by the members, it's not kept by the trustees in their drawers or a safe somewhere in their offices. It has to be kept by a bank that is licensed to offer custody services to a scheme. And this money is not just kept on the account 
to, to sleep and lie there and do nothing. It has to be invested. So this brings in the fund managers. These are professional people that advise on how to invest this money so that it can earn a return. So the money that members collect does not lie idle on the account. It has to be invested in the different asset classes that have been clearly stipulated by UBRA. Mm. We have a detailed regulation that determines how these funds collected have to be invested and how the return has to be given back to the members. Yes. Uh, talking about the legal structure, we wanted to get into the details of that as well uh, later on uh, here. But still on the umbrella schemes, yes. uh, these insurance companies have been, are they regulated by UBRA? No, they are regulated the, by the Insurance Regulatory the, Authority. Okay, IRA. Yes. But they have a product that uh, is a life, mm. a life product, life, yes. that they are required to separate from the other products they offer. So under this product, they are allowed to set up retirement benefit schemes that are licensed by OBRA. So they have dual, dual regulation under the Insurance Regulatory Authority and under the Retirement Benefits Regulatory Authority. Mm. So they set up these retirement benefit schemes to cater for those people who might not be covered by mm. any other schemes. They say the segregated schemes that are occupational based or the mandatory mm. schemes. Actually, Uber, I'm coming to realize, is a very big thing. It is. Uh, it because is. if NSSF is regulated by you, yes. all these other small, small schemes are regulated by you, it means you have quite a lot on your plate, don't yes, you? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And, and I think uh, people out there should actually embrace you know, saving for retirement because I think with so many, you know, bodies that are, you know, keeping, you know, this money and then bodies that are regulating like Ubra, I think there's a lot of safety there True. for the funds. Now, let's move to the legal structure of the pension schemes. I want to get into detail of each of those people. You say the trustees, uh, the custodians. How do you, how is the, the framework for this? Okay. Mm. Uh, retirement benefit schemes are set up, we have those that are set up by an act of parliament. Mm. I give an example of NSSF and the parliamentary pension scheme. Mm. So this act of parliament is the document, we call it in law, a constructive document that constitutes this scheme. When the case of the other segregated schemes, they are set up by a trust deed. This is still a legal document that establishes this scheme, creates it, and has several provisions that govern and regulate how this scheme is going to be managed and run. So you, this, this scheme I has... Know, you're going very fast on oh, that sorry. one, and I, I need to people out there to understand. The Parliamentary Act is the one I'd that... They, 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 we have schemes that are yes. set up by an Act of Parliament. Yes, the Act. For example, mm. the National Social Security Fund okay. is set up by the National Social Security Fund Act. Okay, okay. Then we have the Parliamentary Pension Scheme that is set up by the Parliamentary Pensions Act. Okay. We have the Public Service Scheme that is set up by the Pensions Act. Mm. That is the Public Service Scheme. Mm. So that is one category of schemes set up by an Act of Parliament. Then we have schemes that are set up by trust deeds. Okay. So most of these occupational schemes are set up by a trust deed. A trust deed is a legal document that is signed by <coughs> someone who is called a sponsor. The sponsor could be an employer. In the case of umbrella schemes, the sponsor is the insurance company. The person who makes that decision that I'm setting up this scheme today is called a sponsor. Mm. So this person executes a document called a trust deed. It is signed by the sponsor and the trustees. The mm. trustees are the people who make decisions in the scheme. Just like you see a company has a board of directors. Mm. So every scheme is required to have a board of trustees. These are the people who sit in the boardroom and make decisions concerning the scheme. So they sign this legal document. It has to be registered as a legal document with the Registration of Services Bureau, URSB, and then it has to be brought to UBRA to be recognized as a document setting up this scheme. So once this scheme is set up, then it has to, the trust deed is registered, this, and they have to apply for a license from UBRA. So once you're given a license to operate a scheme, then you can now go ahead and start attracting members to remit contributions in the scheme. Mm. And in addition to having a trust deed, the scheme is required to have the different service providers I've been talking about. The custodian to keep the money, mm. the administrator to keep the records of mm. all the members in the scheme, and to make the, any payments as and when they are due. Then an investment advisor, who is called a fund manager, mm. to invest this money. We also, they, there are also other additional service providers like lawyers and auditors that provide advice to the schemes because we require schemes on an annual basis to give us audited financial statements. So this is how we keep track of the transactions and operations of the scheme. So the legal framework is really detailed mm. to ensure that several layers have been put mm. to protect members' benefits. Yes. 
Uh, talking about the trustees, these people are, are they from the institution that is intending to uh, have a scheme or they can be externally, you know, brought in from from different sources. Like you said, they, these have to be people who are going to actually make decisions yes. on behalf of the scheme. Yes. What if in our organizations we don't trust any, even <laughs> we don't trust <laughs> ourselves to actually make these decisions? So what what does the law say on that? Okay, mm. um, the law says that any person of sound mind and integrity can be a trustee. Mm. However, you should be able to understand your functions because the OPRA Act has gone ahead to stipulate the functions of a trustee. Because in addition to making decisions, <coughs> you're mm. legally responsible mm. for the well-being and safety of members' money yes. and the continuing existence of the scheme. Mm. So most times trustees are people of high repute and integrity and they should be able to understand their functions. Mm. A, a number of schemes have trustees picked from the employers and the, rather from the employer and the employee. We require a board of trustees to have representatives from the employer who is setting up the scheme and from the employees for whom the scheme is set up. Mm. And this applies to both schemes set up by an act of parliament and those set up through a trust deed. They should have this board of trustees. And we've also gone ahead to license corporate trustees. These are companies that are licensed to come and offer this trustee role for those schemes that feel we don't have people or individuals that can take up the trustee role. So these people, these schemes can opt for a corporate trustee. Mm. These are companies regulated by OPRA and required to submit annual returns just like an individual trustee would do. Mm. So for those employers that feel really I have few employees, I can't nominate or I don't trust these people, I can't entrust them to be trustees, then you can opt for a corporate trustee. Mm. But it's also good to build trust and confidence and internal capacity yes, for your own people. Mm. So put them on this board of trustees, empower them. Mm. We have started a, a trustee training program with the insurance, insurance training college to build the capacity and skills of these trustees. Is it free? It's not free, but it's for at a subsidized, subsidized cost, cost, yes. Okay. Because we know that these trustees take on a huge responsibility because mm -hmm. you're responsible for members' monies. Mm -hmm. So you should know the responsibility that comes along with this fiduciary role you're taking on. Mm -hmm. So we have gone ahead to build their capacity. And so far we think we have good trustees that are offering a good service. Mm -hmm. As and when there's need, we keep enhancing and training them to up their game mm. so that we ensure that members don't lose out at the end of the day. Well, who can start a pension scheme? There are people who are now asking, okay, yeah, maybe uh, like we have uh, businesses that have started, like you said, Casita is a scheme. That, they have a know, scheme. They have a scheme. Yes. Now, what if we also want to start a scheme? Who, is there any stipulation of what kind of people we should be, what kind of business we should be doing? Uh, there's no stipulation as to the kind of business mm. you have to be involved in for you to start a scheme, but you're required to be a recognized legal entity. Legal, yes. You should have that legal existence mm. before yeah. you even go ahead to create a scheme. Okay. For example, a company that has been set up, uh, it has its articles and memorandums of association, mm. can go ahead and set a scheme. Mm. Even an employer, for example, Smart TV, you can start a scheme for your employees. Mm have these legal documents, the trust deed, appoint trustees, have them licensed by Ubra, then you start a scheme. And if you don't want to start a segregated or standalone scheme, you can join an umbrella, an umbrella scheme. scheme yeah. Register any to an umbrella scheme and make additional contributions mm. for your employees. Yes. So all these arrangements have mm. been put in place by the regulator. What are some of the investments, the key investments that you as Ubra have actually set aside and say, you know what, if you have a scheme, you have to invest in the following, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, investment ventures that you have okay. to take. Okay, mm. Thank you. I told Oprah has, uh, we've come up with the investment regulations mm. that have clearly stipulated the asset classes, we call them asset classes, yes. within which these monies have to be invested. These include government securities, okay. treasury bills and bonds, this money, and we have, in those regulations, we've gone again ahead to stipulate the percentages. For example, you can invest up to 80% of these funds in government securities because we believe they are less risk and you're guaranteed of a good return. We've also gone ahead to stipulate um, shares, quotages, so you can invest this money in listed companies that mm. are listed on the stock exchange. You can also invest in private equity. These are companies that are not listed on the stock exchange. But there you can invest up to 30%. So you can also invest in real estate, that is land and, pro and uh, immovable property. 
You can also invest in REITs. The capital markets were saying the REITs have grown and in collective investment schemes. All these are asset classes within which this money can be invested. Mm. Uh, you've mentioned those percentages, 80%, 30%. You know, some of these investments are quite risky and uh, they, there's a lot of risk involved, for example, in the equity business. Yes. You know, today you invest in these companies and, you know, everything goes bazak. Yes. yes? yes. How do you regulate risk at, uh, as Uber at, or as, you know, these pension schemes, you know, start investing? How do you regulate the risk taking? Okay, the starting point is that we have set a minimum, th a maximum threshold. Mm. Like I said, for government securities, you can go up to 80%. Yes. And why it is at 80? Because it is less risky. Yeah, definitely. Because we know government will surely never pay. default. Mm. And uh, for equities, it's thirty percent. You can notice the difference yeah. because they are high risk. Yeah. So you go up to thirty percent. However, we've noticed that not all schemes go up to invest up to the maximum ceiling. Many of them are within because we encourage them to diversify their risk. Their risk. Mm. Uh, invest some money in government securities. Invest in private equity. Invest in immovable property, mm. land, and buildings. So that you're spreading your risks. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. So that is how we are trying to mitigate the risk. Mm. And secondly, we require every scheme to have an investment policy statement. Mm. This is a statement whereby the trustees will look at the different age profiles and demographics of their members and invest accordingly. So you can see us, we have a young membership. We can go probably in more risky asset classes, mm. but also spread it out at certain percentages. So this document, every scheme is required to have this investment policy statement. It sets their risk appetite. Mm. And you determine that we can invest only so much in your particular asset class. Mm. So you're required to abide by that document. Yes. And we keep a copy of that document. And on a quarterly basis, they have to give Ubra reports on how these investments are performing to ensure that members' money is not eroded and it is protected. Yeah. Now, let's say worst case scenarios. Uh, a, a certain pension scheme, it has done all these things. It has the trustees and so on. But something happens and maybe they, they, they run away with the money. Uh, are there laws that actually protect uh, the people who have invested or people who have been serving with these schemes? Okay, what I can say that it's not possible for trustees I to... I know you're going to say that, money. but yes. Because as I told you earlier, <laughs> yes. the trustees yeah. do not keep this money. Actually, mm, it's illegal it. mm. for you to collect this money and keep it, say, in a safe or in a drawer somewhere. So, I mean, for starters, you cannot run away with you what you don't have. Away. You don't even have anyone's yes. money to run away with okay. because you are required to put it in a, a bank. bank. A custodial bank. Oh, so okay. at any one time, the mm. trustee is not ex expected mm. to hold money in their hands. So there's nothing to run away with. Mm. This money is kept with a financial institution. And this money, even, even if it's at a point of investment, the trustee does not touch this money. You only issue instructions to the fund manager who will also instruct the custodian. Invest so much in government securities. And oh. when the return is also, there's no money you're touching yes. at any point. There's no point. middleman, like no, I, no, no, I'm no. going to help you connect you to the no. custodian. No, there's, there's no middleman. Mm. And remember now everything is IT yes. done. Mm. So issue an EFT instruction, the money is uh, invested in whatever asset class. And when the returns or dividends are declared, they go straight to the account mm. and to the member's account. Mm. And members have their statements. So I know at every one point how much money I have in the scheme. So there is no point whatsoever that a trustee can run away with a member's money mm. because they don't touch this money. Mm. It's not their money. Mm. So they're not supposed to touch it, although they make decisions concerning the money, but they never touch the money. Mm. Yes. And let's look at now the other side. After people have saved and have, you know, have had their benefits now at the end of their retirement, I mean yes. at, at the retirement age, how do you help them, you know, you know, make good use of this money? We've seen sad stories where people who have sure. saved quite a good amount of money have, you know, lost all their cash, you know, in, sure. in, in something really meaningless. How do you support them so that they sustain this growth, you know, okay. that they have had over time? Okay, thank you. How we are supporting members, first of all, we've started pre-retirement trainings. Mm. We extend this for still in employment and are about to retire even those that are not yet to retire, just to prepare their minds and to train them on how to deal with their money in retirement. Mm. And secondly, we also encourage members to, if, for example, if you want to start a business, start something when you're still young. Don't wait to retire to start something you've never done. Mm. You will surely lose your money. So start something when you're young. You, you, there's enough time to risk and make losses and then 
at the end, mm. when you retire, you encourage to be more conservative because you don't have a lot of time to gamble. Mm. Mm. And secondly, what we are doing is to advocate for payment of pensions, monthly payments, rather than a lump sum. We've seen in the case of NSSF, and mm. studies have shown that members who are given a lump sum blow it up in the first two, three years in retirement and then they become destitute. Mm -hmm. So we are advocating for a policy change and we believe government will adopt it for payments to be made in a monthly, in, 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 in a scheduled payments, monthly payments. Instead mm -hmm. of giving someone a lump sum, I've never touched 300 million and you give it to me today. Anybody, all the schemers will come and start giving me all the ideas. Yes. But if you give me, for example, a small lump sum, then the rest is kept for me and paid to me every month. That way I'm guaranteed, I'm guaranteed of an income in retirement. Because we notice that everybody needs a, that regular income in retirement, and, and however well, small. Yes, and as well, it. that money that remains there keeps accumulating interest. Exactly. So meaning you're yes. still going to get more yes, money. Yes, mm. you're still covered. So we, do, we are totally against the lump sum payments because mm. people waste them. We prefer the monthly payments and the member has a fallback position. Mm. And also to advise people when in retirement, don't start starting businesses you've never started. Yeah. Start venturing into things because you burn your fingers. <laughs> Exploring. Exactly. You know, Don't explore at, at all. Age. No, you can't. Mm. You can't. I, are you telling people you don't have adventure? You know, I'm like, I've you been serving all my at life. Your age, at your age, at your age, we can adventure because we still have some time. Mm. But as we grow older, we're advised to be risk averse. Mm. I mean, take it slow, mm. be more conservative because yes. that money you lose could cause you stress and pressure, mm. and, you know, you, and we lose you. Yeah. So at that age, your advice to be very conservative. Mm. Yes. Well, we are almost winding up this segment, but I would like to, you know, get your 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 side of, uh, you know, how to encourage people out there to start saving for retirement. You know, because as we say on this show, we don't want people to actually get to age fifty-five, like I was discussing with you. And you're still riding a border border. True. You're still struggling in Kampala, selling clothes and doing all this. At least you should have things that you know are helping you. Working for you. Yeah, they are working for mm. you. How could what word of encouragement can you give uh, to people out there so that they can actually start saving for their retirement? Okay, the word of encouragement we give at Obra is that mm. everyone is responsible for their retirement. You and me are responsible for saving for our retirement, and you can start now. You can start small which what, with whatever amount of money you have, start saving that and it keeps growing because you benefit from the compounding effect. When you collect this money together as a group and it's invested, that interest helps my money to grow. Mm. So we encourage every Ugandan to start saving now. Mm. Don't wait until you're old and frail and then start saving because you'll be a destitute. So start now, start small, be consistent, make mm. regular contributions and by the time you retire, this money will be working for you and it will also give you a fallback position that you don't have to struggle when you're old and frail. Mm -hmm. You have this money and if it's coming on a regular basis, every month you expect some money to hit your account, mm -hmm. then you're covered mm -hmm. with the basic needs, the food, the medical. Remember the shelter has now been addressed, yes. so really your money will be for food, mm -hmm. for medical and daily upkeep. Mm -hmm. So we encourage every Ugandan to start saving now. Wow, thank you very much. That was Miss Rita. Nansa C, who is a lawyer and the director legal services at the Uganda Retirement Benefit uh, Regulatory Authority. And we've been talking about saving for retirement because as we say, as we wind up the week, it's a Friday. One day you wind up your, your working life, your energy. Yes, uh, you will not have as much energy as you have. What have you done about that? Are you, are you saving? Are you keeping some money aside? You see there are benefits that are, that are already coming up. 50% of that can be actually assigned as a security for you to acquire a mortgage or home loan for you to actually start constructing your house, renovating your house, or actually buying a property. So why not start saving and enjoy some of these benefits? Uh, my name is Anthony and I'm your host and we've been talking to Miss Rita. We are going to go for a short break, but when we return, we return with more on investment. We are talking to Zeno Investment Company, and a company that has, uh, you know, had a niche in investment and saving. So don't go anywhere. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> 